It's Judd's Hockey Show. And welcome back. We are back. Judd and Declan, Judd's Hockey Show. Wild starting training camp today. And so uh, from here on out through the rest of the season, there will be plenty to discuss. Um, it has been an offseason that has really not been eventful because the Wild, as we've discussed for a long time now, it has, is uh, salary cap strapped and is going to be uh, throughout much of the season, largely because of the buyouts of Parisi and Suter. But that being said, the team is on the ice now. So um, the uh, preseason starts on Sunday with an afternoon home game against some, t- <clears throat> some type of split squad from the abs. I'm getting emotional. I'm getting choked up here, Declan. But I bring to you today five questions for us to bat back and forth, to debate, mm. to talk about. Five questions as training camp opens. Obviously, uh, some of these things will probably clear themselves up before the regular season starts next month against the Rangers. But I want to start with this one. I want to start with what is your confidence in the goaltending, which Mm -hmm. has definitely changed. So open last year with Cam Talbot being the main guy. um, And and then, you know, he was not happy with how he was using the playoffs. Things uh, got a little bit ugly. He has been traded to Ottawa. And now as we start training camp, Marc-Andre Fleury, who just a couple of years ago won the Vesna, but is not a young man um, and as he approaches his 40th birthday, is the top goaltender. And Philippe Gustafson mm-hmm. is the backup. He came from the Senators. What is your faith in the goaltending as the season starts? So faith as in a, a 1 to 10 scale, 10 being I am ironclad, confident, and yep. 1 being uh, sound all the alarms. This might shock you, but I have this at a 7. I have this as a 7. Uh, I, I I don't really expect it to get much better than a 7, but I, I think at its best it should be a 7 out of 10. Um, Marc-Andre Fleury kind of came down to earth a little bit. He was the reigning Vesna winner going into the season this time last year. Uh, Gustafson being a unproven backup guy, who knows what you really have in him. Um, I think Garen still expects that Mark Andre will probably still start about 60% of the games. I know he's up there in age, but I, I don't think it's going to be a true 50, 50 split unless uh flurry's play or an injury happens where it's completely derailed. Um, but Mark Andre Fleury is one of the most decorated goalies of all time. And even though his, Everything about his numbers last year was just about average. It, mm-hmm. it wasn't anything spectacular. Um, he wasn't stopping pucks above rates he should have like he did when he won the Vesna Trophy. But he's a playoff-tested goalie. He's hockey royalty, as you've said before. Um, I'm actually pretty confident with, with the goaltending here. Now, I could have egg on my face because I told you and Mackie that goaltending basically comes down the very similar vein in putting in golf, right? Like, everything right. in golf can work for you, and putting can shipwreck you. At the same time, if you're having a horrible day on the golf course, but you're putting everything in, it makes up for all the bad deficiencies around you too. So I think it goes down to that goaltending, but I, I am actually pretty confident with how it's trending. I'm at a five. I'm I'm at a five because um, what we saw from Flurry in the playoffs was a little, was probably more than a little bit discouraging. He, you know, he was great two years ago, but he's not a young man, and I also have questions beyond him just about you know gone are the days where you could start a goaltender the majority of games and and say okay it's not ideal but that but he's our main guy you're gonna have to have a competent backup here's the here's the wild card and i don't know this might not happen in 2021 22 decks or 22 23 the wild card to me jesper wallstead but he's only 19, and this is going to be his first year playing in North America. So I think he's going to spend the majority, if not the entire season, and perhaps into the next year with the Wilds American Hockey League affiliate in Iowa. Um, but yeah, I'm at a five based on the fact that Gustafson, we don't know. He's a backup. And Flurry, you're going to probably ask more than you want to from him, but you're going to have to draw a line and so i am not i'm not down on the goaltending but i think it's very fair to say i'm not sure i'm just not sure yet yeah it it, it's a little unproven right as in i I think there's a ceiling that's being reached here i don't don't think that the goaltending um is going to 
be one of the best tandems in the league. And Gustafson is such an unknown that you, you, you might have a liability behind him. But, you know, Hunter Jones is in AHL, and I know he didn't have, like, stellar numbers last year in, in the minor leagues, but still he was a prospect that you drafted. Obviously, Jesper Walstead is your future, I think, in a perfect ideal world. And this isn't not to slight Gustafson, but if Gustafson isn't the answer, you call up Jesper Walstead, and he sits behind Marc-Andre Fleury and learns the ropes and gets and gets all that exposure. Now, I think only Walstead only comes up here under two circumstances if there's catastrophic injuries to Fleury or Gustafson. Um, or if he's just yeah. playing so well and the Wild need goaltending help, why not? He's not going to be rushed up here by any means, and nor right. nor should he be rushed up here by any means. Agreed. But I, I think those are really the only scenarios where you'll see Jesper Walstead here in Minnesota as if it's by necessity uh, yes. with an injury or just because he's forcing their hand and you have to get better goaltending. Yeah, I, I think there's a feeling now that at 19, you're probably not going to see a goaltender till what, Dex, 21, 22? Yeah, but you know, so Spencer Knight about- kind of changed a little bit of that. You know, like like people, sure. it, I don't think it's as, especially highly regarded guys like Wallstead. You know, it's not like that these guys have to yeah. be baking in the minor leagues. It's a hard position to figure out. So you're you're, you're right in that vein. But I don't I don't think it's as um, shocking as it used to be. But yes, there is still obviously a due process that has to take place with the development. All right, so number two, uh, and and th- this was. A- touched on by our friend Michael Russo in The Athletic in a piece that he did this week during training camp, uh, the possibility of adding another forward. Now, uh, salary cap-wise, with Kulikov gone and with moves that have been made, the Wild have about $5.7 million to spend, Declan. Um, and there is a feeling, at least from what Russo wrote, that there is that there could be a possibility that Bill Guerin will wait for a team that – itself salary cap strapped and you don't have to be in compliance with the cap until the regular season's about to start and make a trade for forward first of all what's your opinion of that and second of all how concerned are you going to be if that does not take place you know i'm not too um like uh as much as we love to recklessly speculate and try to figure out hey should the wild do this should they add this player should they trade for this person um trying to trying to make up those fun fun storylines because they're always fun to talk about. I, I'm not too concerned with them bringing in another forward. Um, now, Russo's point, and this is also keen around the entire NHL, there's like a half dozen to 10 teams who are at or above the cap, and they have to be camp cap compliant yep. by the time opening night hits in about a little less than a month. So there's going to be teams that'll have to either shed salary. There's going to have to be teams that put players maybe on long-term IR and delay that inevitable. And then there's also going to be guys that just go on waivers because they have to clear this salary. So it probably won't be a thing to watch until we get closer to opening night. Yeah. Um, but I, I, the wild are banking on, you know, guys like Marco Rossi, which I know we'll get into making, making this roster. They, they, taking flyers on, you know, guys like Sam Steele. Maybe Tyson Jost also gets a more of an opportunity now that he's above the fourth line, potentially. So they're baking on more of their in-house options. Now, Garen gets to see this play out, right, in the training camp practices, in the exhibition games, in these split squad scrimmages. So th- they get this luxury of figuring out, all right, is there someone here? But I, I, I don't think um, he is completely glued to the idea that we have to bring in someone. I think if someone catches their eye, right? Yes. If it's someone of Garen's nature that he thinks can help this team right. on and off the ice, then I think he pulls the trigger. But it, it's not something that like I'm too keen on as of this moment of them going out and doing. And if they do this, it very well might not be what we consider to be a name player. Like it, it might be a, a, a Goudreau, Joe's type, right? Like that seems to be, and I, I don't have, have a problem with this at all. That seems to be the what they lean towards. So like they could add somebody as opening night approaches, but it's not going to be a wow move. Um, I also I also think it's going to be intriguing to watch. It sounds like the plan is right now as training camp opens, Declan, for Joe's to get a opportunity to play on the line with Erickson and Felino while Greenway re- recovers from surgery. And I believe Bill Guerin said today that, that he expects um, Greenway and John Merrill, the defenseman, to miss the first, what, five to ten games. Joe getting that opportunity does intrigue me, um, partially because of this. I've always wondered if the commitment to Greenway is going to stick. Uh, if Joe steps in there and plays well, He's just, Greenway's always struck me as a player that probably drives them crazy. And this goes way back for us because of the up and down. Um, Mm -hmm. And if Joe steps in there and plays well, if they would 
at least consider moving Greenway at some point. You know, I, I think Garen loves Greenway off the ice. Um, you know, they're they're just a com- camaraderie with him, the whole big rig campaign and, and all that stuff. So I I do think he's a good apple in the locker room, and he's part of the culture that that Garen wants to build. Um, so he might frustrate you on the ice, kind of like similar to like a Charlie Coyle and all those Granlin and Zucker and you know guys that were here previously that had blips of being successful, but how were they the best in the room? You know, were they also encouraged from bad leadership above them? It wasn't always on them. Right. I think he really likes who Greenway is as a as a person mm-hmm. and what He's he means in that locker room. Yeah, but there is a point where if your play is not up to par, well, then, dude, you're going to lose playing time. Um, so I don't think he's as like on as much of thin ice or there isn't as many question marks to me about his game right now than there was a year ago at this time. I don't think there's as many question marks about who he is as a player or his game, but there is a point where if he isn't delivering, well then at the end of the day, I mean, some, some, some type of change has to happen. So I'm excited for Tyson Jost to get a significant run. He was the 10th overall pick. He's been buried on the fourth line. He was buried in Colorado. Um, and there could be a significant case to be like that. Hey, he's just not as good as we thought he was going to be when he was drafted 10th overall. But I do. I, I watched him play college at North Dakota. He was the 10th overall pick in a draft, so there was clearly some legitimate pedigree to his name. Came and I'm more soon. curious on what he can do as a player. Yep, yep. And and th- this will be an opportunity for him to probably shine a little bit offensively with a couple of guys who, who are very defensively responsible. So yeah, yep. I think this is going to. I think this is going to provide some clarity as to who he is. And once that clarity is there, it's going to probably open some doors for potential moves. All right, third talking point, and I personally believe that this is important. Marco Rossi, um, who was coming off the COVID and heart scare condition last year and was no question in training camp slowed um, and not and not probably back in hockey shape at that point, uh, goes on to play the majority of the season with the Iowa Wild, has a really good year, and now is going to compete for a job. I know he's still young, but it's my opinion it is important that he wins a job to start to get National Hockey League experience, and I want to see results too. So I don't consider this like a nice trial. I think that we are getting to to the point now where you want to see this kid play and play in a top six role at center with this team. That's my goal. That's my thought. Yeah, they're they're banking on the fact that he'll make this team, and in fact, I I think he will. I, he would have to have either an injury or just a significant step back in his development for him not to make this team. Now, that's why I'm not too also keen on them adding another forward because I just think it creates a log jam where I'd, I'd rather see Marco Roth, unless they just got someone unbelievable, right? Like if they well, add just, some classic yeah. slappy that's a bottom six dude, like that yeah. blocks Marco Rossi, that blocks opportunities for Tyson Jost, that just blocks things. So that's why I'm not too keen, at least right now, on the idea of them adding another forward because I, I just don't think it's worth it on their end because there's other in-house options I'm more intrigued by. Um, mm-hmm. And also for, from that cap side, you know, they, they have like $5 million in the cap space. They have to always keep that buffer of about a little over a million for the call-ups and, and, and recalls and be players being sent down and whatnot. So you have to be cap compliant. And then also, if you go to the trade deadline, you need some cushion, you know, more cushion to absorb things if you want to make a move. So I think Marco Rossi is probably, you know, I know we we talked about goaltending and forwards and whatnot, but he's kind of the one A talking point at training camp this year. Is he ready to crack the lineup? Is he ready to be the prospect that everyone has made him out to be? Yes, he had the uh, the, the health scare last year, and thankfully he's now healthy and stayed back in Minnesota because he was focused on trying to make this team. Didn't want to leave the country and whatnot, which is the yeah. Judd Zolgad plan. Don't leave the country. I do not like people leaving the country. So he's focused on making this team, and I'm curious to watch him play, man. I mean, we saw him play, what, two games, I think, last yes. season. You and I went to that home game as well that he was in, and he wasn't, um, I don't think he was a liability, but he was unnoticeable, which can be a fine thing when you're trying to just make your debut and get your teeth cut a little bit, but there's expectations for him. There's expectations that he is the first legitimate center that Bill Guerin loves uh, to be asked about and be bugged about, and can he take that first big step? And it's also t- telling that... Um, was being moved from center to wing because of this, because we all know that Dean loves Goudreau. Like he loves him like a kid. Um, and Goudreau, you know what? Surprisingly, last year I thought played well. So like credit to him. But that being said, I think the move of Goudreau to a, a wing for now shows the commitment 
to getting mm-hmm. Rossi in and playing. Um, the other thing I'm curious about, and they're not going to address this at all, Dex, until it until it actually becomes a becomes a not problem. That's not the right word. It becomes an issue. But um, right now, there is a definite uh, th- the way that Dean's talking. Ryan Hartman is going to continue to be the center for Kaprizov and Zuccarello. If Rossi starts to play really well, like if Rossi takes off, and we don't know, he could, um, will they look at that too? Because, you know, ultimately, I think at the end of the day, you're going to want Kaprizov and Rossi together. Like I And I get it. At first, he's probably going to play him with Boldy and Goudreau and that. I get that. But I'm talking down the road, you know, if we get to January or February, Declan, and Rossi is playing well, really well because i gotta think that hartman's gonna have regression to his game like i'm hard mm-hmm. i'm hard pressed to think that that a guy who's good but certainly not great is going to have as, as statistically of impressive year as he did last year and, and i have to think that there also is a plan in place where marco rossi is eventually playing with kaprizov if not th- this year then next but if he plays well it's a definite conversation. Hey, should these two play together? And I think it's probably a good conversation to have. Yeah, I, I I think that top line can stay intact for right now. It should. It was a very good line. Kaprizov and Zuccarello have legitimate chemistry. Ryan Hartman had this career season. Um, is that, you know, can can he keep that up? Was that a fluke? Was that an aberration? You know, is he going to come down to earth hard? I would like to think that he's probably going to regress to a degree. And Marco Rossi can be someone that could potentially step up and be your true number one center. And, you know, let let that process play out, right? Like, let you don't have yeah. to bail on that plan two games in by any means. Um, and by the way, for and this is a warning, because I, I think some for whatever reason, we were kind of mocked by this, that the first 10 games of both Kirill Kaprizov's uh, um, two seasons so far, the COVID season and last year, where he got off to a slow start, right? Like one goal in the first 10 games, yep. and then explodes, and he was great. Yep. But he's your superstar. And you can't really, uh, you can't really get into a habit of just having your superstar take games off. And yes, there is expectation, and there's a slow bake there that hey, he'll find his game and he'll be fine. But the, he he's a slow starter in his career. He's been a slow starter the first two seasons in the NHL. But he's obviously one of the best players in in the NHL right now. How long does that leash remain if Ryan Hartman and Zuccarello and Kaprizov get off to slow starts before a change can be made? Where yeah, you, you plug in Marco Rossi. That's the goal, right? I think. Marco yeah, Rossi playing on the top line. That's Eventually. that's the end goal. 100% right. All right. Next talking point. Do you like the fact that Ev- Everson has uh, discussed and is going to start training camp by breaking up Spurgeon and Middleton and Brodeen and Dumba, and they are now going to put Spurgeon and Brodeen uh, together on the first defensive pair, Middleton and Dumba on the second pair your your thoughts on what is a pretty substantial move to what the defensive mm-hmm. pairings were uh once the Middleton trade was made with San Jose last season yeah you know Everson kind of explained this logic and this is where I love a coach that you know kind of looks back at things and has to address a change and even though you might be used to something you have to also adapt and change always and you know he said that we want to get Spurge and Brodine th- against the high, high-end speed guys and high top-line guys, and rightfully so. Those are their two best defensemen. They're, that's no question. The, right. the two best defensemen on this team, whether they're paired or not, are Jared Spurgeon and Jonas Brodin. So I kind of actually like the idea of having your top two guys playing that shutdown role. And Spurgeon, Middleton, in general, are bigger dudes that can throw their weight around a little bit, right? Like the Wild are a small team. The Wild, I mean, yeah, Felino's, Dumba, you know, don't yeah. mess with Marcus Felino, but, yeah. but Felino and Dumba and Jacob Middleton... They are responsible for kind of throwing around their weight and being being you know heavy hitters, if you will. So actually, I like this idea. I think this is a a good plan to have. Um, let Spurgeon and Brodeen be their shutdown defensemen. Good luck trying to score against them. They've historically done a very good job at suppressing chances and suppressing goals. So put those two together. I know you might be making the case that you're putting too much eggs in the first pair basket, right. but I personally am a big fan of it. I liked it too, and that that's what drove me nuts when Suter would always insist that he had to play with Spurgeon. And it's like, no, no, put Spurgeon and Brodeen at that time together. Um, I will I will say this. Among the players, Declan Goff, that I want to see 
major steps from in consistency and actually points as well. This to me is it for Dumba. Like we need, we need far more. And, and when he plays well, I really like him, but it's my opinion that going into this season, we need to see the good Dumba a lot more. And that guy can score goals. That guy can get points. Middleton can be the stay at home guy and he's Mm -hmm. perfect there. And you know what? That looks like a great trade right now, but I need to see Matt Dumba apply himself every night. Almost. I get he's going to have off games at times, but we both decks have raved about him for the last three years. Like when he's playing well, he has so much potential. And then we'll go into these spurts where we're like, what's he doing? So I need to see Matt Dumba at his best, which means, and, and Middleton being his partner should actually give him a lot of confidence that he can take the puck and rush it, that he can shoot more, that he can be in a position uh, where he can affect games in, in ways that when he does it, I think are special, hard to find. You know, and you know, he had the explosive year in the year he got hurt in the fight against the Chuck and he was having a career season. He was, he had double digit goals very early. He was shooting the puck at the highest rate of his career. And ever since then, whether it was injury related or not, he has kind of stopped shooting as much as he did in that 32 games where he was lighting the league on fire. And it's, yep. it's no secret analytics or non analytics that the more you shoot, the more likely you are, you're going to score a goal, but he's also kind of been a little bit more tempered. And it's it's a little little surprising to me. And again, that might be the injury. That might be that his pec will never be the same again. And that's now that's sports, and that's just getting and older. He's now last year, right? Yeah, Punched and long or something. And so. he's you know he's now entering. I know he came up as a 19 year old. He's now 28 years old. He turned 28 this summer. So he's he's now been in the. It's kind of crazy to think he's already played over 500 games with the Minnesota Wild. I remember when he was called up. I remember when he was drafted, and I was still in college. And now all of a sudden he's logged 500 games. Um, and he's in a contract year, man. Like this is yep. this is the last season of him being under contract. So this is a big moment for him, and also a, a big decision that the Wild have to make long term with Matt Dumba. And which one are you going to get? Yeah, and I need to see the good one a lot more. Uh, last yeah. thing, last thing, we'll stay on the blue line. Kalen Addison, does he make the team? And if he does, does he get the legitimate shot that he should to run the power play? Uh, they, they basically, Dean said that they are going to keep the scheme of the power play largely the same, but the personnel will change. I think Addison deserves the first opportunity to run this thing. And yes, we need to see far more from it. Uh, I would love for him to, to make this team. There's something a little strange going on with either two (laughs) things, either his game hasn't blossomed to where Bill Guerin wants it to be. Yep. Um, or he's just, yeah, not cut out to, to be a legitimate NHL player. And he, and Garen traded from him from his former organization in Pittsburgh, knowing who he's familiar with. Correct. And even though he might put up decent AHL numbers, which Kalen Addison has done so far, and, and he's clearly a high offensive player that, or a high offensive defenseman that can, you know, ignite a power play and shoot the puck and create opportunities that these new defensemen are creating nowadays. Um, he's also a bit log jam. He's going to be on the third pair which is you know, a, a testament to how deep the Wild's blue line is, but how much of an opportunity can you give him? And then if he's going to be the third pair guy, which, again, I'm fine with, can you find opportunities where he is at least on the second power play, if not the first power play? I think unit, he should be so. on the first power play to start. I, I think he should get that. That power play um, was consistently underwhelming. Oh, yeah. I, I think if this guy has a role, it's third pair defenseman, first pair power play defenseman at the blue line. I think that's a incredibly fair. Now, if it doesn't work, it you know, it falls flat. Okay, that's fine. Try something else. But that power play needs a spark. And how many times last year, you know, when when we were at games in the press box at the X, did we not see that spark? So yes, I think Kalen at least deserves the chance to be on the first power play. All right, Judd's Hockey Show preview of training camp. We're Plenty back. more to come. We'll we'll be back. Well, hell, we'll probably be back fairly soon yeah. as uh, news breaks, as roster decisions are made. Declan, you take us home. Hey, hit the subscribe button now that uh, the winter sports season is starting, the fall sport, winter sports. I'm not a big fall guy. Everyone loves fall in this Love state. I think fall. it's the most overrated season oh, in the world. God, it lasts it's like It's maybe good for like 
14 days and then I'm just sick of it. I love this Um, weather. But the best part is, is the Wild are back. The Timberwolves are back. Flagrant Howls. So if if you're a basketball fan too, you get that double dip with Phil Mackey and Kyle Tige, who will be doing Flagrant Howls. Of course, Judd's Hockey Show will live on here. Judd and I will be, uh, there was a six week absence from our last episode, Judd. And I don't think that'll be the case now for the next, hopefully eight to nine months. And nothing happened. I mean, I know people were like, where's the Judd's Hockey Show? We uh, we're not going to pull things out of our, our behinds yet. Well, we, you know? we might try once in a while, but I mean, that was a yeah. dearth. Of- it was it was rough. Uh, so hit the subscribe button, Daily Minnesota uh, Sports and Minnesota Wild Entertainment. This has been Judd's Hockey Show. Pass, shoot, score. <laughs>